Last Thursday, we had an AMA on the Binance International Telegram channel. And in the last part of the AMA, we answered questions from the community. There were over 1,000 questions there, and we only needed to choose 10. So obviously, we chose the simplest ones, like is Beam the best privacy coin? Certainly. Can I become a Beam ambassador? Of course you can. Or will Beam Confidential DeFi support liquidity mining? Yeah, sure, why not? It was a perfect crime. And we would have gotten away with it were it not for our very extremely vigilant community member, New Morlock, who noticed that and he exposed us on our very own Telegram channel. And not only that, he went back there and he chose the questions that we really needed to answer. He painted us into a corner. He put us on the spot and all the other metaphors, which basically mean the same thing. So we had no choice but to answer those questions. So in this video, we will do just that. Hi everyone, I'm Alex and welcome to this Beam Pulse special Binance AMA New Morlock edition. New Morlock, this one's for you. So here are the questions that New Morlock wanted us to answer in no particular order. And the first one is, Part of the reason that DeFi works on Ethereum is because anyone can check the contract of all the transactions. How will Beam Confidential DeFi balance the competing needs for transparency when it's needed and privacy when it's wanted? So it's a great question, of course, and this is how it's going to work. The contracts themselves are completely transparent. The code of the contract is written in any of one of the languages that can be compiled into WebAssembly which is what our Beam Virtual Machine can ultimately run on our node. So whether the contract is implemented in C++, Go, Rust, or any other language, and then it is compiled, and the compilation process is deterministic, so anyone can take the origin, the source code of this contract and compile it and make sure it's the same code that is currently deployed on the blockchain. So in this regard, our contracts, which we call Beam shaders, are no different from the Ethereum ones. However, Beam transactions themselves are confidential and whoever sends the transaction and all the details of the transaction are obviously invisible and completely opaque and cannot be seen. However, the state of the contract and ultimately the state of the node can be verified by anyone running it. So yes, the transactions are actually private, but what is happening inside the node when the contract is running is not, and hence can be validated. So for example, if we talk about front running, which is a major problem on Ethereum, no one can know who is sending the funds, and hence you cannot track specific whales, as a lot of people actually do. However, you can see when a large amount of money is being uh, deposited into a contract. You can see that, but you cannot know who is behind it or where it's coming from. The next question is somewhat similar. Beam transactions are untraceable. Then, how any merchant verified that payment is made by me or anyone else? Well, actually, it's a problem that exists in Beam today, and we have solved it with payment proofs. The way it works is that you have a specific wallet ID, which is not unique. You can generate a lot of these, so it does not really identify your wallet, but it does serve as an additional signature, which you apply to your payment, and then, you can generate a proof, and you can do this today inside our wallet. There is a small button called Payment Proof, where this transaction list at the right, at the top of the list, and you can send this proof to just anyone. And of course, this proves that a specific kernel is related to a specific transaction. However, it's not enough because you also need to show that this specific kernel was mined and is actually part of the blockchain by referencing this kernel in the Blockchain Explorer. So these two parts, the payment proof and the existence of the kernel in the Blockchain Explorer, together provide proof that you specifically have paid specific merchant and the merchant has signed the receipt. 
The same thing is true for our offline transactions. And in the next version, which is 5.2, we will add payment proofs for the offline transactions and of course, max privacy transactions as well. Moving on to the third question. I'm a professional vulnerability finder on the web. Do you think your system is secure enough from hackers? Does your project have a program that rewards individual vulnerability detection of the system? So first of all, of course, when somebody finds a vulnerability and reports it to us, we will check it out. And of course, we will provide some kind of uh, reward or bounty for these vulnerabilities. I'm not sure that we have like specific price list for each type. I think we determine it kind of on the fly, depending on the severity of the vulnerability and how much it actually applies and how much risk it exposes the system to, but uh, definitely we, we do that. Regarding the security of the system, we're talking about several different components. So obviously the most important component is the node. And yes, we consider it secure. And of course we test it thoroughly, including stress testing and we also, of course, do code reviews and audits, security audits whenever new functionality is added. Also, there are wallets and our wallets, as you know, we have desktop wallets and mobile wallets and we have a web, web wallet which was not released yet on mainnet, partially because of this security issue. It's less secure than our desktop and mobile wallets. And obviously, whatever product we release into the market, we make sure that it is as secure as possible of course, there are also the website and the blockchain explorer. These are relatively less secure because they also are less important for the vitality of the system itself. So they can be DDoSed, for example. Even though we do uh, have all kinds of mechanisms such as Cloudflare and we can apply under attack modes. So it's not very simple to do that as well. But obviously these components are less rigorously tested than the node and the wallets. What difference is it between the BIM core and BIM compliance? Can you describe each track and what work is entailed? So right now we have two major tracks. The first one is the wallet track and the next version that will be released is 5.2 and then 5.3 and all the features are specified in our roadmap, which is linked in the description below. And the second track is the confidential DeFi track. And there we will release next month our BIM X, BIM confidential DeFi experimental platform with our version of smart contracts and uh, a lot of other stuff which is DeFi related, such as an ability to trade assets in the UI wallets and such. And these are the two main tracks that will follow us, I think, uh, probably till the mid middle like, of 2021. Um, compliance, and I think what the author of this question meant by that is our opt-in auditability features, they are actually implemented on the infrastructure level inside Beam node and wallets. However, they are not yet exposed fully in our UI. And we will definitely do that uh, whenever we pull all of these things together, we will also provide our auditability features. And it's important to understand that this auditability is completely opt-in. It's only relevant to whoever wants to track these transactions and report them to auditor or authorities or anyone. It is in no way implied that someone can take this information without your knowledge or authorization. If you want to, you can use BIM in a completely opaque way and not report anything to anyone. I hope this answers these questions, but in any case, let's move to the next one. Mimblewimble was initially scriptless, but then scriptless scripts have been implemented. Are there any security side effects of this? So Mimblewimble kind of implied the idea of scriptless script from the very beginning, because all that scriptless scripts mean is that you can verify certain aspects of the transaction on chain, while these information was actually calculated off chain. Like for example, when we implement our atomic swaps or laser beam channels, that's exactly what we do. The wallets together sign specific transactions with specific conditions, and then these conditions are verified on chain. Like for example, for the laser beam channels, you need relative hash locks, basically hash lock that is related to another hash lock in previous blocks. So yes, some of these functionalities are definitely uh, very important for system security and can screw things up in a major way, which is why everything we implement 
we do security audit. And of course, every time there is a major release, we do that again. And we also provide very rigorous testing on everything that we do to make sure that no problems happen with this feature. But of course, like anything else in software, there are issues and bugs. And theoretically, like everything is possible. I'm not sure that scriptless scripts are like more error prone than any other components in the system. But of course, any additional complexity makes testing more difficult and introduces new chances for bugs, which is why our software development team and our QA team work very hard to make sure that doesn't happen. Next question. Revenue is an important aspect for all projects in order to survive and keep the project slash company up and running. What is BIM way of generating profit slash revenue? What's the income model? So as you know, BIM was financed and is financed through the treasury model. And the treasury in our case means that 20% of each block reward for the first five years goes to the specific treasury and then it is distributed to our original investors, to the team and to the foundation which runs and governs the project. And BIM Foundation is currently paying salaries of the developers who are working on this project. So we can say that right now, the most important factor for the longevity and continuity of the BIM project is the price of BIM because it directly impacts how many dollars we have in our treasury. So how many months we can continue development or how many members we can have in our team. That said, we are currently uh, working on, and especially in context of the confidential DeFi platform, on attracting more decentralized community of open source developers. And in doing so, we will have hackathons and bounties for specific projects when we roll out our BMAX experimental platform next month. So that even if for some reason or at some point in time, this money will run out, we will have enough developers in our community who can maintain and build new things on top of our platform. Next question is about oracles. What are some strategies for Beam to build a cost-effective, scalable and secure decentralized oracle system? And then there was probably another question, or maybe it was a part of the same question. Oracle is an important infrastructure for the blockchain industry. How did Beam research and develop about Oracle? If the Oracle is breached, the smart contract will be breached. How will the Beam resolve? this situation, I presume. So let's start with the first part. Um, decentralized oracles are not exactly strictly impossible. However, they probably work in a little bit different way that we might think. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that. There are two types of kind of decentralized oracles today. The first one is an oracle which is created as a byproduct of, let's say, Uniswap style balanced pools. When you have some price, which is reflected by the balance of two different assets in the pool, this price can be then emitted as an oracle to other contracts. Of course, the price can fluctuate and then we depend on the arbitrageurs to come and balance it back. So the price will not be accurate at any moment. However, it, if the system works uh, well enough, it will be, might be accurate enough for some other applications to use. So this is kind of a decentralized oracle in a way because no one person can actually influence it. On the other hand, we know that there are several attacks against these pools including flash loan attacks, as we have seen multiple times in the immediate past. And therefore, these oracles are kind of less reliable than the centralized ones. The second type of decentralized oracles in some form of like closed ecosystem where like everyone can vote on a specific value using either proof of stake or any other incentive mechanism can also be considered decentralized oracles. But of course, since Beam is a proof of work coin, and it's not actually possible to implement this specific idea right now, it might be possible with the addition of the smart contracts in the future. But once again, it might be in a way less reliable than centralized solutions. Regarding the centralized oracles, 
we have several ways to go. We can, of course, partner with some existing Oracle providers, such as Chainlink, or we can implement this infrastructure ourselves. Well, of course, the most important thing in any case is that these oracles are not easily attacked. And this is actually achieved through two mechanisms. The first one is to make the source, the immediate provider of the Oracle data as reliable and safe as possible. And also it means adding some kind of averaging or median calculating mechanism that will ignore outliers and that will not allow to easily manipulate the prices by just controlling one or two sources of the Oracle data. So if you have enough different sources which are unrelated to each other and their data is processed uh, in a specific way, you can be pretty sure that uh, the system is actually good enough and stable enough. But of course, like everything is possible and a lot of precautions need to be taken. I think that answers that. And uh, I think we will start with like more centralized solutions and then we'll see how it goes. And uh, of course, uh, we will always welcome any cooperation from existing Oracle providers and uh, integrate with them as well. And now to the last question, which was actually asked by New Morlock himself, is the current development team planning to transition to for-profit projects built on Beam Chain after roadmap development is completed? This is a very good question, and I understand where it's coming from. So Beam right now is a platform, and the platform like Ethereum or any other platform uh, is basically not for profit, and th thus it is governed by Beam Foundation. Having said that, there are applications that could be developed on this platform. Specifically, we have talked about wanting to implement things like confidential stablecoin and uh, confidential AMM swap-based exchanges and things like that. So yes, these things could definitely be for profit and we might consider building a specific team or maybe separating part of the team to work on these projects in the future. Right now, most of the Beam developers are professionals, which means they rely on their salaries to feed their families and, you know, to live. So because we think that our team right now is doing great and very quick and very high quality developers, we would like to keep them around the project for as long as possible. And of course, they're very passionate about the project. Of course, they're very dedicated. But having said that, they will still need a salary to you know, live. And which is why we need to carefully balance between different projects that we do in a way that ultimately will provide the most benefit for BIM as a cryptocurrency, as a project, as a platform, and everything that it represents. So to summarize, I'm not sure exactly what will happen in the future. We might do for-profit projects on top of BIM that might happen. And in any case, the foundation has enough money right now to maintain this project for a long time, of course, depending on the price of BIM. But whatever we do, we will not in any way uh, interfere with the ongoing roadmap of BIM. And this roadmap is still far from completion, even though we're doing quite a lot. We still have Ghost Deck to think about and a lot of future projects. So I, I do not think we will be completing it completely in the next couple of years, at least. So that were all the questions from New Morlock and questions that he found on our AMA channel after we have left it and forgotten all about it. So we would like to thank him very much for doing that and to keep it up. And thanks everyone who participated in the AMA. It was great, a little bit crazy, but still pretty amazing. So, so far, have a great day.